Let's check if it... Hello. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another typology interview. Um, so I'm downloading it at the same... We'll multitask. We're okay. We just had a little bit of a, a observer thing. Um, so you actually had a, a thesis that you wanted to share with us that I, like I, I by accident caught it um, that you did an interesting <laughs> thesis where it kind of lines up with the human needs. But um, let's talk about how you got to typology first. And I'll, in the meantime, listen to you and deal with the observer thing. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. It was an accident, I guess. I just stumbled upon Dave's YouTube channel by accident. I think it was because I had heard something about Myers-Briggs and then got really disappointed because people said, well, it's not accepted in the scientific community. Then maybe a year or later or so, um, I researched it again because I was really intrigued. I got, um, I did the 16 personalities test. I got INTJ and was like, yeah, finally someone understands me. Um, which is totally not my type, but um, at least I got the IJ right. But then, yeah, yeah. I don't know. just by accident, I guess, like a lot of people do. Yeah. And um, so have you been able to identify with your type uh, since? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, it all makes sense now. <laughs> right. And so, so the feminine SI, are you seeing that? Like, is that something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have well, a good explanation of how, how you've been seeing it? How? Well, it's, um, I think that this is also something that I've heard from other savior SIs. Not all of them are feminine. I think the feminine is just that it's uh, very um, um, fuzzy in your mind and that you can't seem to st actually stack on it. But it has a lot to do with thinking that you have to organize what is already there out of a scarcity mindset. So okay. you view the material things in the world to be very scarce and you're constantly scared that what is already there is going to break down, die off. So it's an impulse to overwork what is already there by using it in the most efficient way, I guess. And that's why you then stack it because you're like, well, um, and the way we plan is also very much blind towards the future. I've heard Flores explain this in the most perfect way, where we uh, walk through life backwards because we look at our past steps and this is how we then extrapolate where the next step into the future would be, I guess. And that makes sense? Like you're looking through your past steps to see the next step? Or... Um, yeah, well, I guess looking to make sure like a past process, you can repeat it. Yes, but yeah. I guess that with a lot of things with op, I wouldn't have thought that that's what I'm doing until I really saw what other people were doing compared to me, because um, right. I'm not an overly nostalgic person or something. It's just a lot of thinking of um, not trying to imagine what could be possible but more um, seeing where where you could go with what you already have and thinking that all that's good is already inside your box <laughs> all <laughs> right any sense. Yeah. yeah because you think that i don't know it's not very logical yeah yeah um just so you know in the, in the meantime i'm downloading a powerpoint viewer i don't actually have office here yeah but just letting you know <laughs> yeah. we got it yeah on the thesis because you mentioned it just as a um, quick clarification well my thesis wasn't actually on this topic i just used this theory because it's very popular among social scientists um and i used it just as um as a tool to help me with the interpretation of my own data but I did not uh, look at this theory in close detail. Oh yeah, okay, great. Well, the formatting is off. I'm really sorry about that. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's because of the, the silly viewer, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, okay, well. <laughs> I don't know why it's showing my whole desktop though. Hmm. Anyway. 
So this is so so you did this during your thesis. It's well known because I actually got in yeah. touch with the guy who who figured this yeah. out or whatever was in charge of it. I never. Yeah, did. and he's like, no, I don't want an interview. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Right. Well, I get that. Well, this guy, yeah. I think that probably a lot of people may, because it's really popular. So is it? okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the institute I used to work at and I that I wrote my thesis at is of political science and even in political science you know in the entire world of social sciences and psychology people use this theory because um yeah it has a long history and it's very powerful in its simplicity i guess okay. <laughs> yeah so just maybe you can so this um yeah this so this is a theory on values, right? And in OP, we don't, we think of values as something that's related to the deciders. But this theory, I want you guys to look at it in the context of the human needs. So um, you're gonna see as soon as you can see the pictures on another um, slide, not yet, Please go back. <laughs> go back. Okay, sorry. And <laughs> yeah. um, that it overlaps very, uh, almost a, like completely with the human needs that we use in op. And basically, the thing that I'm getting at is just so that everyone who's interested knows that the scientific community is well aware of these human needs and that there's actually a lot of data to prove that these exist, just that they don't look at it in terms of traits, personality traits, something that you inherit inherit genetically, but in terms of a value that you hold. Yeah. So they're looking at the human needs as as values that people hold and it's not necessarily genetic or in, ingrained mm -hmm. or born with. Are yeah, they tracking that, that different people hold different values and it can change as well or um it's not so much about the change. Well you're gonna see that it's about what the values do we all have in common. And how mm -hmm. are they structured? Okay. Yep. Now you cool. can go to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, as you already said, you reached out to the sky. Right. <laughs> Shalom Schwartz is right. his name. Please correct me if I mispronounce his name. And this, re this research was first published in the 90s. Um, and a bunch of people have worked on it, but mainly him. And they have developed it, tested it over the years across different cultures. And as far as I can tell, it's the most popular theory on human values to date. Nice. There are other ones as well, but it has the highest predictive power. Yep. So they've done comparative research on other theories. And in when you talk about popular, it's like popular amongst academics. Exactly. It's not, yeah. it's not like... Pop, cited yeah. in scientific right. papers that have been published. exactly cited in yeah, okay that's it popular in scientific papers <laughs> right. yeah. so that means that a lot of people basically what it means in <laughs> in my terms is that a lot of people find it helpful i guess right, <laughs> and right. Or they base their research off of it or stuff like that exactly and right. they use it as predictors for nice. a bunch of different things for example um this is just because i know it in this context you can predict what people are going to vote or which party they lean towards based on their values and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's also a theory that Dave and Chan have brought up that yeah. your functions are related to where you stand on the, not necessarily like that's, that it's a complete overlap, but I think that you might see some patterns there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and, I mean, if there is clustering, so then you'll get these peaks. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And what was new about it is other researchers in the past had already discussed similar values, but Schwartz had a very good description of what the nature of these values is. I'm going to talk right. about all of these in more detail. He also and, put it into a framework, like a holistic framework, mm -hmm. no? Exactly. Yeah. And that is exactly the point too. This holistic framework is how these values are structured relative to each other. And that's what makes this theory so interesting and so useful. And then he also talks about, um, because they did a lot of cross-cultural comparisons on the context of the culture and the values and how it might be different or the same in different cultures. Yep. So next slide, please. Okay. So 
So oh, this is like this, a 12 page presentation. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Did you make this just for us or this is Yeah, this is this is because I'm in quarantine currently. <laughs> oh wow. All right. And, and today is my last day of quarantine, but this is how I ended I didn't expect it. this. What a treat. <laughs> okay. This is yeah. SI blast here. Yeah, right. exactly. Well, okay. So the first point that I brought up was the nature of values as Schwartz understands them. So he says, he uses this term beliefs, values are beliefs. You could also think about it, if you like, in terms of um, a concept or um, maybe you could also think of it in terms of a program. That's not how Schwartz would say it. Maybe in the context of a P, you would think uh, values are programs. But I like to stick with this term beliefs about how we as humans can meet our fundamental needs. And... Mm -hmm. These values, they exist indi individual and also on a group level or societal level. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty basic. Okay. Then, yeah, sorry, just interrupt me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering what the overview is. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get there, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah. You're going to see. Right. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait. Okay. Still on number one. This is kind of the reason why I do it like this is because I have Xavier SI and I think that I need to establish the premise, you know, okay. of my argument. Yeah. So and the second point that is also very similar as with Op is that he says that values are linked to affect. So when you're in a situation where a value becomes irrelevant, it becomes triggered. And that means that you experience some kind of an emotional reaction. And these emotions are there because they motivate us, because they set us in motion so that we can act and fulfill these human needs that are rele relevant in the situation. And then he also says, similar to Op as well, that values are used as judgment criteria or standards. I think that's mm -hmm. pretty much one to what Dave and Shen say. And also that they exist in hierarchies. So you might say, this is important. This is important to me as well. But this is a little more important to this. Then you can, uh, can get kind of a stacking of values. Yep. Right. But this is like, so with human needs, we have our human needs stack. And we don't get to decide what is above the other. It's just sort of, it comes that way. Well, that's a good question. I guess you're raising the question of, which part of this is genetic and which one's right. not right because like course, as an ip the highest value for me is like okay independent thinking or whatever or, yeah. or like respecting each other sort of thing that's yeah. like higher right whatever and then the next one is like freedom right underneath that right so i'll have like these values stacked mm -hmm. like naturally mm -hmm. exactly. and then growth is like overturning those or just being okay with i don't know we <laughs> will get there i guess yeah, I, I'm not sure about that, but so far I think you summarized it perfectly. So, of course, values is a very feel, feelery term, but in the context of this research, values is just, you know, even as a thinker, you might say, well, independent thought, if you have Xavier Chai, that's my highest priority. Right. Because you could think that that's something you believe, or you could think it's a program, whatever you like to believe. I don't, yeah. Right. All works. So. And on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So this is the most important point, I guess, the structure of values. So Schwartz says that values have underlying goals. So there is a this goal is related to the human need that it's related to. And for example, you can have the value of um, benevolence. Uh, you can have the, the, the goal that's related to the value of benevolence is, as it says here on the slide, preserving and enhancing the welfare of those with whom one is in frequent per personal contact, which is the in-group, so your right. close-knit community, you know. And he says also, which he shows in his model, that some of these values are compatible and others are in conflict. And you're going to see on the next slide very nice. I'm not going to go into detail here. <laughs> you're going to mm -hmm. see very nicely how this pans out. So the structure of values that he proposed, which made his research so groundbreaking, was that you could see within his data, not just from the theory, which is very important, how these are compa compatible. 
So on to the next. Nice. So you got the data. And then you also have an energy <laughs> dom joke here, I see. <laughs> we can't be too info in our PowerPoint. No. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Hell no. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm sorry that this is. Oh, yeah, this is the this is the diagram I kind of saw, and I see the formatting's kind of off, but that's okay. We'll get by. <laughs> but like yeah. this is a diagram I saw, and I was like, oh wow, like this perfectly maps to OP, yeah. right? I don't know why mm -hmm. these aren't straight axes, like why he why he did that shift, but I'm sure there's a reason. Mm -hmm. There's a but, yeah. reason. So I'm like to explain the reason hedonism here, I saw pointed to consume, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And then like this is di. And then yeah. this is OE. And so OE yeah. and DI meet and consume right there. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, on the right side, I ordered it in the same way that it's in his right. theory. Yep. Yeah. It yeah. That it maps perfectly onto it. Yeah. So you definitely have the DI here and then the DE here. And mm -hmm. then so here should be, should technically be blast, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then here technically should be, um, um, what's it called? Uh, sleep, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Security and power. Well longer than you figured. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. tech technically, this should be play. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mapped it out in a different version, but we can go to the next slide. I think people now they saw what it's about. Why this is right. interesting. Yep. So, okay, this is a very important point for research like this. This is a statistics driven research. Of course, of course, they first uh, think about what values do they want to look at, but it's very much powered by statistics. So mm -hmm. they don't think of it in terms of biology like we do here, and they don't look at values as coins. So it's not like this is one side, this is the other side, no. Um, in research like this, you get a spectrum. And you can define your values as as narrow or, or as broad as you like, you know. Of course, then you have to test how good of a predictor these values are. But in theory, you could do whatever you want. You just have the statistics that tell you, you know, information about how good of a predictor this is in your specific situation. But in the original research that we already saw on the slide before, they decided to slice it into 10 values but you could also slice it into more or less values because yep. to them it, it's a spectrum, right? Yeah, and I, I think like the same thing we're seeing, like, cause we're, we're slicing it into four animals, right? Yeah. And in the animals, they have like a whole variety of values yep. and descriptions in those animals. And I think mm -hmm. that's where the anecdotes come in and they contradict, mm -hmm. right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then that's... here it also kind of overlaps, like there's the DI goes into consume and then goes yeah. into OE. It's kind of like a continuum yeah. there. Yeah. So some I... of those slices are OE and some of them are consume. <laughs> yeah, that's right. so good. Yeah, that's such a good connection that you made. <laughs> good okay. that we're doing this together. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, and the next slide you're going to see this is the refined one. Well, the refined one is from last, last decade. So they were like, okay, right. can we make this better? Can we get a better um, outcome for this? Can we uh, create better predictors for the studies that we use these for? But of course, it always depends on the context of the study, what model works best, you know? Mm -hmm. But this in general, you know, it's, it's a more just slimmer slices of values. So this is just what you did before, just spelled out for <laughs> okay. types like mine. <laughs> yep. You can see in this um, refined model that he labeled them too. So you have the social focus and the personal focus on the other side. So you have the DE and um, the DI component, and you have the self-protection, which sometimes it's also called the prevention of loss goals in other papers of his. And I like this prevention of loss goals. And then you have the growth or anxiety-free or the promotion of gain goals. And this is exactly what you described before. If you combine the social aspect and the prevention of loss goals, you get the right. loss, the DE and the OI. And you I'm can still, do... I'm still quite annoyed at why this aren't these aren't 90 degree angles here. Like okay. what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Um I can exp yeah, let me yeah, explain go for that, it. um for a second. Well, okay. So I already said before, apparently talking is hard for me too. <laughs> um I already said before that this is powered by statistics. Right. Right. So yeah. I did not look into how exactly they did the statistics because I, I checked what methods they used. I have no background on these exact methods. And I thought that I and wanted yeah. to just 
spent my Sunday in a different way. Right. But um, you're also presenting this. You're not proving it. You're not. You're just yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you have the sources at the end of the, and I can give you an overview right. over why it looks like that. So um, basically, the results of these statistics. So they have the first one is confirmatory factor analysis. That's a type of factor analysis. The second one I already forgot again because I had never heard about it before. But with um, statistics like these, the result that you get at the end is for all of the values that you looked at or for all of the factors you could call them that you looked at, you, you get them mapped out in 2D space. Mm -hmm. And the way that they are positioned to each other, you have a distance between them. And this geometric distance tells you how similar or different these factors are. So... Mm -hmm. That creates, so you can imagine you have a 2D map and then you can draw lines between these um, factors that you have um, where there is a significant difference, where you see a significant difference. So that's why these axes, they are not in straight lines because they are really a result of where your factors set on this 2D map, if that makes any sense. Is it, is it population based too? Like the n sheer number of people? That's the statistics? Like the likelihood someone would be? No. Like if I were to throw a dart at this board sort of thing? <laughs> no, it, it doesn't work the reverse. I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but it doesn't work the reverse way. Like, um, like is this kind of like a population distribution? That's why it's sort of skewed? Oh, no. That's just no? because of how different these are. So he said, well, there is a very significant difference between the stimulation and achievement, which is why the line is there. And that's because, just how is it Is it because matters. people can't hold those two values simultaneously? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think okay. that that's the case. Right. I think it's more that, I don't know. This is pure speculation territory. It's all right. That's all we're doing here. We're just speculating. I, I would have had to read the statistics. <laughs> yeah, yeah chapters but i guess it's just that they saw well what i was going to talk about at the end but anyways i can talk about it now is that they see that these quadrants they see them across cultures and i guess just because these divisions mm -hmm. are so apparent between the values that's why you have these thick lines because right. they just group like that and the wonkiness of these uh, lines, the, the reason why they are not just straight like a coordinate system, just comes from the fact of how they were grouped in the data or how the averages in the sample looked like. Maybe right. that's what you meant, but it doesn't yeah. really, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I saw this also back when I, I originally saw it. It's like, why is blast humility? That's an interesting way to call blast. Let's call this <laughs> humility. Humility. But yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think, well, the reason why I find it interesting to look at these words is just exactly for that reason, because it helps me look at the animals in a different way and right. think about the nuances that there are to them, I guess. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So then I think we can go to the next slide. If people want to look at this in more detail, they can pause sure. it or something. Yeah, yeah. Or they can look it up. I'm sure it's around. Yeah. So... Then we have this third aspect, which we already hinted at, which is that um, this theory or these questionnaires that they use as a basis for their analyses, um, they did them in 82 countries and they took representative samples in 37 uh, countries. So the samples were designed in a way that they actually represent the population of this country that they looked at. And in total, they have, so it's a lot of data. And I think that's, if you have Sevia SI especially, <laughs> that's really important so that you think that this is actually probably, that there might be something there in this concept, right? So this is what I find so exciting about it because, um, you know, this theory has been developed for, um, how long has it been? Well, it's been over a decade, probably almost two decades, and it still holds up across all of these cultures. So they find that this structure, especially these quadrants, maybe a bit wonky quadrants, that they yeah. are almost the same across all samples that they looked at. The distribution, yeah. 
it's the way that these axes, yeah. So the the OP human needs the equivalent mm -hmm. to them. Yeah, they see them in almost all samples in a very similar structure. Right. So that would point to these are culturally universal. Of course, you could say, what about um, a small tribe somewhere, somewhere, somewhere? I don't what, know. What's interesting about that, though, is like it's it's looking not only at culture, it's also looking at like racial. Mm -hmm. It has to. Right. If that's what it's doing. So it's like yeah. it's like racially universal and culturally universal. Yeah, of course, maybe there's always a way to make a study better. Right. You know? But to make it more representative of humanity, because I guess that's what OP is trying to do, to have a model that is representative for all of humanity. But I think this is a very strong database because yeah. they also, these questionnaires, you know, people don't fill them out in English. They fill them out in their mother tongue. And they also use them on children and people who aren't educated in Western schools. And, they and have they're obviously own... getting good sample sizes too. It's not just yeah. who do we choose out of the celebrity doc or you know, who is interested in typology, all of these EPs coming in. It's like a, <laughs> a proper a proper uh, sample size, yeah. Yeah, I would guess that they do that very carefully, but of course yeah. I can't know for sure. <laughs> I mean, small children is great because you probably grab them from schools and like that's a great yeah. distribution there. Yeah. yeah, the schools are good because um, you can... Sorry, this sounds so bad, but you can force children to participate. <laughs> I know this because this is also what I did for my thesis. <laughs> All right. Otherwise, they get told off. Yeah, they start at the age of 12, I guess, with these studies. That's what I've read. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, I guess it's a pretty di diverse uh, database, but it could always be better, of course. And you can crit find criticisms. And um, they find, though, that even though individuals or group can have very different value priorities, that especially the DE values, especially the one of the benevolence, is very important in most samples that they looked at. So there are some kind of similarities across cultures. And I'm not totally convinced by the theory that, that they bring up in this paper, but that's for everyone his own judgment right um, yep so yeah i, I mean thought... like just the fact that um i mean I, I guess this is more tony robbins territory but also david chan right and then this i i'm pretty sure there was no cross communication even though this is very popular so yeah. like if yeah. two people are coming to like the same result and in, in whatever way they're coming to it there for me that indicates that there's some kind of truth there yeah yeah. I mean, a lot of other people that aren't original researchers have, you know, people check these theories, of course. Right. Yep. They try to read. Yeah, that's even better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, and and it's yeah. Well, it's just like I if just... you do have a methodology, there could be like, like to go and dissect this and figure out, okay, how did you do this? Like, how accurate is this? It's it's a big task, and it's like it's going over. Task. Yeah, uh -huh. it's going over so many. And like one little error could propagate or like this one mm -hmm. methodology could propagate. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so like, I, I don't doubt that the science is there. I, I just personally haven't gone into it, mm -hmm. but yeah, what I am seeing on like an extroverted side is wait, like another person is coming to the same conclusion and they're yeah. not connected. That means. That's that what I thought was exciting. Right. I was like, Oh yeah. my God, <laughs> patterns overlap. What the hell? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I guess, I mean, of course, it would be very interesting to really look at the method of how they do these things yourself. But I can't even tell you. I think everyone who did some kind of science in university or something like that knows how difficult this is to reproduce. Right. A I'm, sure, I'm sure Shalom Schwartz could, Dr. Shalom Schwartz. But he declined my interview. He's too, yeah. he's too popular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He is very popular. Yeah. Well, but I mean, maybe I'll just go to the university here. He's next door, <laughs> oh, that's like an so hour away. Cool. Yeah. I'll just go bother him. <laughs> I guess shove a camera in his face. Students bothering him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I found a groundbreaking way to use your theory. You yeah. No, it. I'm not going to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to point the people who are very consuming. I wanted to point them because of this culture debate, right? There's another theory that I personally really like, even though it's 
not perfect and not as uh, refined, I guess, yet. Mm -hmm. It's called the moral foundations theory. I put it in the literature the next section. It, okay. Yeah, it's the last slide. And you don't even have to read the paper. There's a very entertaining podcast. It's on a podcast that's called Rationally Speaking. Okay. And they interview one of the, the, the authors of this theory. And it's called, oh, wait, I forgot to write it Well, maybe, down. maybe we'll throw the links in the description. Or if someone oh, yeah. finds a link, they can post it as that a comment. Would be good. But yeah. um, if you search for more... Um, moral something uh, on the podcast rationally speaking you can find it it's a highly interesting podcast episode and well it just talks about how different cultures approach integrating the individual 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 person into society and that might point towards this discussion of why are people of the same type sometimes so different so it i think that there might be something said cool. to um what the cultural base of this is you know i don't know it's just maybe i don't know i somehow see a connection there i can't prove anything <laughs> yep but nice yeah if you're interested look at it the podcast is very easy listening i think yeah uh, i'll and, check it out for sure <laughs> and that's it yeah so next slide or that's yeah, it. please go to the next slide. It's just the end slides. Okay, uh, yeah. Conclusions. We already talked about them, but I, I'm going to repeat this still because last. <clears throat> so the thing that I wanted to say basically is that the, these human needs, even though they don't call them, the, these are the human needs, but they call them value orientations. The scientific community knows about them and they use them a lot. And I think that so there is a good database for them and everything. And just in the context of this research, values are not personality traits. So mm -hmm. um, even for me, I would say value, um, freedom is an important value to me, even though I'm an IJ. That's totally possible because it's a value, not a personality trait. So I don't know how exactly these <laughs> concepts are <laughs> clicking together, but yeah. And I thought it was interesting to it was interesting to me because I think that this uh, theory helps understand what the nuances of the animals are and of the human needs are, and it also shows what kind of similarities and differences exist within groups and cultures and nationalities. Yeah. Nice. Um, there you go. Yep, that's it. And then yeah, well, thank you so much for <laughs> yeah for for giving this. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's here's your literature thing. Oh, of course, yeah. you can You're find such an info dom. What's going on here? What is that? Yeah, that's what you <laughs> like to think. That's my only consume. <laughs> <laughs> that's your only consume. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, it was a good consume. Very useful. Yeah. <laughs> I hope. Well, yeah. I don't think that it's gonna help with typing. It's just it was interesting. I mean, it might. I mean, like if if. Like this stuff is all well researched and stuff. So it, and and they have mm -hmm. extra words there that like maybe aren't connected to OP quite yet yeah. as patterns. So yeah. and if they do fit in the wheel, like if it is really mm -hmm. a three sixty wheel and they fit there, so then yeah, we some extra typing techniques could pop out of this for sure. Yeah, and maybe yeah, maybe um, I think that what I like about it is just the flavors of the animals. So you can see what kind of a word or concept you could associate right. with, with an OI version of DE. Right. Or yeah, something like And I that. also wonder how much of like the originator's biases and the way he views like calling consume hedonism is like, yes, I guess you could see that's like the negative side of consume. Mm -hmm. um, but like, and then, and then calling the blasters like, uh, what did they say? Humility or benevolence or whatever. <laughs> I guess like that's the very oh. positive extreme. So it's like, you know what? This is something that I actually thought about a lot. I think in the human values, contrary to OP, I think this is where I see the biggest difference. Is um, you know how Dave and Shan talk about how DE is the ultimate goal because it's uh because you want to have this goal of grow and give. That's the Tony Robbins goal, right? Sure. So okay. the ultimate goal would be to do a version of DE. But if you're an EJ, 
or if some kind of Soviet DE, you have a very childish version of this. So maybe inherently your type knows that this is the ultimate goal, but you don't do it in the pure form because you are not doing it from a place of abundance. Abundance, did I say that right? And yeah. in the values, if you look at it as a value, of course you're going to see it as the most purest giving form of universalism, benevolence, and not a scary EJ. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? So I think that's maybe the difference when you look at the value that yeah, that there's a different tone. But, I mean, so like it's, okay, this is not connected to the theory, right? But I'm speculating on maybe like there's, there was a little bit of projection in the initial, in the initial, oh. uh, yeah, distribution I mean, of, yeah, these values. Researches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean like, okay, so, so um we all tend to see the negative side of our demons more than the positive side. Yeah. Yeah. And then we tend to see um, the positive and the negative in our saviors. Right. Yeah. yeah that's. And so calling consume heat, like, I guess, I guess it is, I guess you could call it hedonism. Right. But I think it's, it's, that's the negative side of it. Yeah. That's, it's also the DI version of this because there is also the independent thought and action values right. which lean more towards the um the other side which is actually the de but i guess that's more the the right. ep version of this consume but yeah, no, you know only in this wheel independence and respect and things like this is also very yeah. di like right so yeah, i mean I, like i do see the positives on the di i also see the negatives obviously but um because they're my saviors, my brain is kind of telling me that there's more positive than negative or whatever there. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, that's totally legitimate. And these are, you know, I don't know. Of course, it would be very fun if you're like, okay, so I'm an IP with lead consume. I'm going to see what is the most perfect word to describe what I'm doing <laughs> in this will. And then it's not what you think it would be. And then it's just right. of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Yeah. And I think also like the word humility is is an interesting one to pick because yeah. I think all of your functions can have a form of pride to them and yeah. they can also find a form of humility to them no matter what function you're using. Yeah. Um, well, okay, maybe think about it like this. These values, don't look at them in the context of OP, but see them as the societal projection of what this goal is about. So it's kind of a socially acceptable version of what this need is about. Because we this is what how Schwartz looks at it. You have these values because you need a concept to describe what you're going after. But um, you do that because you need to communicate to others what you're going after. And that, of course, needs to be framed in a way that is socially acceptable. So maybe this is the reason why yeah it's sometimes maybe it's a, the wording seems a bit weird yeah and then the other thing is like the, because of the flavors of the functions in those animals as well it changes so because like i saw he had thought somewhere mm -hmm. and yeah, thought and action there was no right. feeling <laughs> right right and and depending on your functions your thought could be somewhere else in a different mm -hmm. animal right yeah yeah well in this i really like this uh IJ, EJ uh, uh, wording of creating stability for self, society, mm -hmm. and no, uh, creating stable uh, societies, relationships, and self. So that seems pretty accurate for Blast. Yeah. You know? So some yeah. of them I find are quite it's, hit. But it's, it's, yeah. But like, okay, so that's good for blast, right? But it's like the positive spectrum of blast. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not Whereas, taking into account Karen, you know, the Karens. The Karen, yeah. She doesn't right. appear on this wheel. Right, exactly. <laughs> because EJs don't exist in, in this wheel. Right. It's just but like the Karen wrong. form of blast. The Karen form of blast isn't there. Like the negative side of it isn't there. Yeah. Because that's not a value that we hold, you know? Right. So maybe. Oh, so hedonism is a value that we hold, I guess. Is mm -hmm. that what you're saying? And yeah. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So here's the thing. 
researchers picked this term hedonism because they thought it was the best word that they could come up with to describe all the values, all the other values that they used in this questionnaire that, that got grouped together in this place right. on your map. So they looked at all of these and they were like, ah, what do we call this group of values? Hedonism, I guess. So yeah. It's interesting because my consume, I wouldn't define as hedonism in any no. way. No, right. I get that. Well, <laughs> maybe yeah. you identify more with the self-direction. Yeah. Self-directed. Maybe. Thought. Who knows? But like, <laughs> I, can, I can see that there, there are hedonistic ten tendencies to, I'm sure, every personality because it's a value everywhere, yeah. right? Um, and But I, I'm, I don't know if it would come from, it might come from consume, but I don't know. Yeah, well, it also depends on how you define hedonism. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. A matter of definition. Yeah. <laughs> but so, but but yeah, it's interesting that they didn't have they didn't split out the functions in order to find this wheel. They ha they kept like they didn't they kept the functions because in the population they have all the functions, and they sort of uh, found the wheel despite that that they didn't separate it out. You know. Uh, no, I didn't follow it. I couldn't like, follow you. Like you, you have all of the four flavors of consume in the population and out of all the four flavors and consume, they still sort of got the data clean enough to make conclusions like this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ah, that's what you mean. Yeah. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, we didn't I really talk don't... about you, Hannah. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I mean, th thank you so much for presenting this. Um, yeah, sure. it's, if people have questions, don't bother Hannah. Hannah's asleep first. <laughs> Leave her alone. Don't try to get into an go, intellectual Yeah, discussion. go send an email to Professor Schwartz. He loves being contacted. I can attest to that. Like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> the internet is after me. Who are these people? Right. Yeah. No, of course, you can send me a message. But please don't be, be mad if I don't respond right away. Right. Or I'm... <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. Well, lovely as always. Thank you, everyone, for checking this out. And uh, thank you so much again, Hannah.